Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us from around the world and thank you to the organizers of APLL for, for all of their hard work in bringing this conference online. We're grateful that despite some of the particular challenges of this present moment, we're able to be here virtually with all of you today. This is a joint presentation. I'm Catherine Strong. And I'm Kate Lindsay. So before we get into the presentation, we first want to acknowledge the sovereign rights of the indigenous communities whose lands we occupy as white colonial settlers. I was born and raised in the ancestral homeland of the Moekma Ohlone tribe, and I was introduced to linguistics while studying on land that has yet to be returned to the Wakbakut band of the Ocheti Shakoin Oyate. I currently live within the Aina of the Hawaiian Kingdom, where generations of Kanaka Weebe have shaped the wisdom and power of Hawaiine, and that Queen Lilia Kalani yielded under protest to the United States. I was born and raised in the traditional homelands of the Wiyat, Yurok, and Pomo tribes of Northern California. I got my graduate education in linguistics in Muekma Ohlone land, and I currently live and work in the original homelands of the Mashpee Wampanoag, Akinwa Wampanoag, Mi'kmaq, and Massachusetts tribal nations. We have inherited and continue to benefit from privileges won by the disturbing legacy of settler violence and its structures inherent to the present day. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to the lands on which we are all presently gathered. We also recognize the extent to which our research is influenced not only by our individual backgrounds and experiences, but also through our participation in a society that continues to uphold systems of colonialism, white supremacy, and racism. In our approach to our work, we celebrate the diversity of linguistic structure and aim to center languages that are underrepresented in the literature. But that, of course, is not enough. Hundreds of years of anti-Blackness in the United States and globally has not and cannot be corrected. Nevertheless, we are responsible for replacing the racist ideas and policies that support our institutions and educational systems with anti-racist ideas and policies. We can do this through education, direct anti-racist action, and committing to support the Black Lives Matter movement in our own communities. There are also local movements within our regional areas that we can support, as well as targeted calls to action within the field of linguistics that require our attention. All right, so today we'll be giving a talk, Sociophonetic Variation in the South Fly, Evidence from Ende. And we're very excited for this opportunity to talk about Sociophonetic Variation in Ende, which is a Piatori River language spoken by the Ende Tan in Southern New Guinea. We are actually the last of four talks on Ende being given at AQLL this year, which is incredible. We hope you all had a chance to attend those as well. So there is a growing body of variationist research that's taking place specifically in Southern New Guinea, but we still know little about variation and change in the languages of this region. So in our presentation today, we will primarily be discussing some preliminary results from my dissertation work looking at variable retroflex affrication in Ende. In doing so, we'll also situate our research alongside other investigations in the region and illustrate some of the broader impacts of studying variation in a minority language. But first, we'll introduce you to the people and the data collection that made this work possible. This research is grounded in a collaboration between the Ende Language Committee, the Ende Speakers of Limo Village, and various linguists who support the Ende Language Committee's initiatives. Warama Krupel Suede, Wagiba Gesser, and Tonza Warama, who are pictured here on this slide, founded the Ende Language Committee in 2007 and have contributed significantly to the research that we're presenting here. Ende is one of six language varieties in the Pahatori River language family. These languages are spoken in the South Fly area of Southern Papua New Guinea. There are about 600 to 1,000 speakers of Ende total. I started working with the Ende committee, community in 2015. At first, our goals were to establish a writing system and to begin collecting words and stories for an Ende dictionary and several Ende storybooks for the schools. Almost everyone in the village of Limo was interested in contributing to the project in some way. And in terms of people recorded, we had on average 50 different speakers contribute a recording for the first three years of the project. This pattern changed in 2018 when we doubled the number of speakers represented in our corpus, topping out at 101 speakers. There were two reasons for this uptick in speaker participation. First, the Ende speaking community decided that the voice of every willing Ende speaker 
should be included in the corpus. This motivated many people to contribute to the corpus who had been too busy or too shy before. Second, the Wellsprings of Linguistic Diversity Project directed by Nick Evans at Australian National University was just starting to release the results of their first four years of work integrating sociolinguistics and language documentation in the region. Ari Kashima, pictured here on the left, and Dinika Hoken here on the right, had been working with the Nembo and Idi communities that neighbored Ende. The corpora that they gathered were large enough to start investigating sociophonetic variation in these languages. Specifically, Ari investigated the pattern of initial H elision in Nimbo, and Dinika studied the pattern of final N elision in Idi. They both identified that these phonetic variables co-varied with meaningful social factors in the communities. This inspired me to collect enough data to do a matched study of final N elision in N day, which then led to Catherine's investigation of retroflex affrication in the N day corpus. I collected the data through the use of a sociolinguistic questionnaire that was composed of 56 questions about social practices and linguistic practices. Wagiba Gesser and Wadama Krupel helped me translate these questions into Ende, and I interviewed more than 70 native Ende speakers, which was nearly every available adult in the village. The questions were selected based on similar questionnaires used by Dinikas Hoken and Christian Doler in nearby areas. They also included questions that I felt would get lengthier and more interesting responses, such as, tell me about your grandparents and what were they like? These interviews were done monolingually in Ende. They were video recorded and they lasted between 20 to 40 minutes per person. I collected 73 interviews, which were evenly spread out across reported gender and age cohorts. The age ranges reflect cohorts that are socially meaningful within the Ende community. In total, we collected about 25 hours of interactive discourse. The, phone the phonetic variable that I was looking at was verb final n elision. If we look at this verb phrase in one, mana sana yu nagagen, I cooked sago on the fire, the n at the end of nagagen is sometimes pronounced and sometimes not pronounced. I looked at several social factors to tease out the differences in realization rates between speakers. These included factors such as hometown, sex, age, clan, marital status, and orator status. The only significant social factor for N realization was orator status. Orators are leaders in the village that use their voices to command attention, bring about change, and assert themselves as powerful within the community. My understanding of this category arose through questions in my survey that touched on occupations and community roles within the village. Not every orator had a named status within the community, but all orators indicated that they either volunteered or were appointed in community leadership roles. To give you a, an idea of what this type of oration sounds like, I'm going to play you a short clip of Warma Krupal Suede welcoming the village to a feast. I've bolded some verbs in the subtitles that end in N, and you can hear how they are audibly pronounced. So that was Zwarama Krupa. Um, so the, um, the data that we um, analyzed for the final N elision weren't oration acts like this, but all came from the sociolinguistic questionnaire interviews that I conducted. So in my study, I found that orators like Warma realized verb final N 51% of the time, while non-orators realized verb final N only 30% of the time. Of course, this corpus of 25 hours of interactive discourse was big enough to look at several sociophonetic variables. And this was around the time that I met Catherine and shared the corpus with her so she could keep investigating uh, the sociolinguistic patterns that were waiting to be identified in the data collection. 
So to begin my investigations, I decided to look, as Kate has said, at retroflex affrication in Ende. So the retroflex affricates are tested in almost all of the Pahatori River languages, and in production, they're realized primarily as either affricates or stops. So in the following two audio clips, you will hear Gloria Wadama producing first a voiced affricate and then a voiced stop. And these examples are drawn from her recording of the sociolinguistic questionnaire. So as Kate has said, with the breadth and balance of this type of collection, we can ask the sociophonetic research questions that I'm particularly interested in about language use in small multilingual communities. So before we can really dig into the rich relationships though between linguistic and social factors, we first need to know more about the phonetic variables of interest and which social factors are relevant or hold value within the community. So Kate's study of verb final end realization informed by ethnographic documentation that she mentioned, took that first step in identifying a link between one linguistic variable and one social factor. Um, I took another step in the same direction by conducting a pilot study in collaboration with Kate and Katie Drager of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, again, we looked at this retroflex affrication, which Kate had identified as frequently produced in the corpus. We wanted to know if this second variable is also linked with order status or any of the other edict or emic social factors that are present within the community. So we found that retroflex affrication is indeed linked with order status and that among those speakers who are orders, there are also effects of gender and age on the variation pattern. So in the remaining half of this talk, I'll describe the data and methods we used, and I'll discuss the results for a pilot study. I'll also outline how I'm broadening the scope of this research for my dissertation, and I'll underscore some of the considerations and implications of studying variation in minority languages. So out of the 73 interviews that Kate and the Indian Language Committee collected, we looked at data from a sample of 16 speakers, sociolinguistic questionnaires for this study. Um, this sample is balanced for gender and age, as demonstrated here. We have four for each age group and then eight men and eight women participate. Um, the distribution of orders and non-orders in our sample though is uneven. Um, it should be noted that um, even though in this table there are no speakers in the order row for age 15 to 29 and for the non-order row for ages um, 46 to 61, um, that's only the case for this particular subset of 16 speakers and there are community members who hold an order role in those age groups among the total 73 who recorded sociolinguistic, sociolinguistic questionnaires. So for the auditory analysis, I extracted both the voiceless and voice retroflex tokens from the Elan transcripts um, of these questionnaires. I treated the variable as categorical and binary. So I coded tokens as either an affricate or a stop based on my perception of the sound while listening to the individual audio files. Um, we ended up with 981 tokens, or 64% of the total, coded as affricates, and 561 tokens, or 36% of the total, coded as stops. So five tokens were removed prior to further analysis due to ambiguity or elision, um, and a second listener also coded 10% of the tokens to check for intercoder reliability. We both agreed on 74% of the total realizations, with the second coder identifying more of the tokens as stops. Um, some tokens were noted um, both during the original coding as well as um, during the reliability coding that they contained an alternative realization such as a fricative or a flap. So future research will necessarily include detailed acoustic analysis to identify and analyze this full range of realizations um, for this particular variable. Um, I think especially in an understudied language, we're oftentimes really still figuring out what these kind of phonetic components look like. Um, so we're really at that stage. Um, in addition to being auditorily coded, each token was also annotated for multiple linguistic and social factors. Um, and I then used a multivariate statistical analysis to explore the effects of these factors on the variation, which we're gonna look at the results now. So for this statistical analysis, I ran a mixed effects logistic regression models, one fit to data from all 16 speakers and another fit to only the nine orders. Um, this first model, which is fit to the 16, reveals that the likelihood of stopping for these speakers is linked with a combination of, like I mentioned, linguistic and social factors. So in particular, significant effects of order status. 
um, between orators and non-orators, voice between voice and voiceless tokens, as well as syllable position between whether the token um, was in the onset or the So as we can see in this plot here, orators are demonstrating higher rates of stopping. So in the left panel, we can see that orators are more likely to realize the token as a stop versus an affricate um, compared with the non-orators who are listed on the right panel. Among these orators, younger speakers seem to be producing less of their tokens as stops and older speakers, especially women, seem to be producing more stops. So it looks like there might be some kind of a pattern here. Um, and in running our second model, we wanted to see if there are any effects of age and gender when we're controlling for orders. And yes, there are. So in this second model that's fit to the nine orders, um, it reveals that among the orders, there are higher rates of stopping for women versus men, as well as for older speakers versus younger speakers. Um, in contrast, we ran the same model um, on the non-order group and there were no significant effects of age or gender observed. Um, which is really quite no noteworthy. Um, so in this pilot study, again, here's the, um, the orators only. We found the realization of retroflex stops to be linked with speaker gender and age, but again, only among those orators. So these results, along with previous finding, findings that orators are less likely to use an elision than non-orators, um, it, suge it suggests that there may be a cluster of linguistic variants in NA that together are forming some kind of order style. So this is something I'll be thinking about much more in depth for my dissertation. But in considering these results in particular, um, we can ask, why do orders realize more tokens as stops compared to non-orders? What might be motivating this? Um, and we think that this may be linked with prestige. So there's some evidence that the stops are an older, more conservative realization than the Africans, in which case it would make sense that orators, um, who as Kate explained earlier, earlier, hold these positions of respect and leadership in the community, and who are regularly engaging in this inherently language-oriented task like oration, that they might be using these stops as a kind of prestige variable. Um, this may also be supported by a link that has been classically drawn between oration and power across multiple oratorical models in the Pacific. Um, this interpretation is also consistent with women orators producing the highest rates of stopping. So we know that in changes from above, there's a tendency for women from Western societies to use standard variants more often than men, um, which stems from women's societal position um, in these largely patriarchal societies of the West. That position is one of lower status and less power. So when socioeconomic, political, other avenues of accessing power are not available, women may use prestige variants as a way to access a kind of symbolic power. Um, speakers of NA do describe how power is unevenly distributed in the community um, and how strong gender roles are empowering men and assigning them the highest positions in the village. So we can argue that orators may be using this stop realization as a way to access that symbolic power. Um, and this aligns with trends that we see um, in other lar um, more well-studied languages around. So as many of us here are familiar with across different fields of linguistics, um, sociolinguists have generally centered their research around these more well-studied languages, particularly in the West, um, especially the speech of monolingual English speaking communities. So there does arise this concern about the generalizability of dominant sociolinguistic theories when we apply them to disparate contexts. So for example, indigenous, minority, endangered, and otherwise underrepresented languages are frequently overlooked in the literature, but the potential for differences in social stratification is high in these contexts. Um, Mansfield and Stanford call this the principle of sociolinguistic distance, where they argue that the greater the distance, be it geographic, cultural, economic, between a lesser studied language community and traditional sociolinguistic settings, the higher the likelihood that such research will pose challenges to current theories. So this is where collaboration between ongoing documentation efforts and variationist research can be mutually beneficial, both in broadening and deepening the description analysis of the language and making it more available, but also in identifying social factors that are relevant or meaningful for the community. Um, sociophonetics is largely focused um, on predetermined kind of broad demographic categories like age, gender, class, 
Um, but these categories can fall short oftentimes of capturing the full range of social factors that could be influencing a pattern of phonetic variation. Um, along these lines, our work presented today is informed by a second wave variationist approach in which ethnographic documentation informs the researcher's understanding of what social categories are locally relevant um, and also helps us to explore configurations of these local categories within the more broad demographic ones. Um, for example, as we've seen with this study today, um, that relationship between order status and then also age and gender in NDA is something that we might have been hard pressed or not even able to see at all without these um, ethnographic methods being employed during the data collection. So that's um, uh, really important, I think, for studying variation in minority languages to keep that in mind. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll be continuing this research for my dissertation um, in order to evaluate whether the ret retroflex affirmation findings are aligning with or contradicting greater patterns of variation in NDA, um, or if they're posing any kind of challenges to current linguistic, sociolinguistic theories in general. My dissertation will expand the number of variables and genres and speakers from whose, da whose data to be analyzed from 16 speakers looking just at one variable in one genre to 49 speakers, um, looking at three variables across three genres. So broadening the scope of my study will support the analysis of variability both within and between speakers. Um, and it will treat the variation as pattern driven in how the social factor of community order may be linked with these multiple variables. And additionally, how these variables may be linked with one another across speakers. It will also strengthen the degree to which these patterns can be argued to represent regular systematic linguistic behavior of the Indian speech community, rather than just the realizations of a handful of individuals. Um, and one of the benefits of uh, studying variation in a small, um, a small speech community is that you really can get um, a representative sample um, of the greater population that is oftentimes unattainable with like a mega world language focus. Um, so this, uh, in talking about samples, this selection of 49 speakers has been balanced to the extent possible. Um, but again, we all know that real life data, it's not always possible to do that 100%. Um, but with a 51% order, 49% non-order distribution, the sample actually does reach that level of balance, which is really incredible to work with. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll also be looking at two additional variables along with the retroflex affrication, um, which are post-alveolar deaffrication, um, which has kind of four realizations that have been identified as a variation so far, um, as well as word initial velar nasal deletion. Um, so some exploratory coding of these variables has already shown that there is variable realization. Um, so I think that there's going to be a lot for me to continue investigating here. So lastly, I will be expanding genres from just the sociolinguistic questionnaires um, to also include targeted word list um, elicitations that were recorded with the 16 speakers, as well as I'm hoping to um, look at these variables as produced in recordings of comma orations. Um, so by comparing spontaneous versus elicited to kind of potentially formalized speech of the same individuals, um, I'll be able to touch on an even more fine-grained questions relating to formality, style, within speaker variability, and just so much more, which is really exciting. So in thinking about the broader impact of variation, variationist research in minority languages, um, I think Miriam Meyerhoff puts it so beautifully when she writes, we speak in symphonies and not sonatas. Um, a sonata is a musical composition for one or two instruments, for anyone who's not familiar, um, while a symphony is a complex extended piece written for a full orchestra. So Meyerhoff is, to me, Meyerhoff in this quote is describing how linguistic and social systems layer together in these wonderfully intricate ways and how the patterns of one are interlinked with the patterns of the other. Um, we can't necessarily um, separate language and society, right? So extending this music metaphor a little bit, because I used to play the bassoon in high school, um, there's an orchestral technique called doubling, where two or more instru instruments play the same note. So I was always with the French horns. 
um, which is often used to increase the dynamic power of the note or make its projection in tone fuller. So regarding variation, I think that this could be a really elegant metaphor for um, conceptualizing those relationships between linguistic variables um, themselves when we're treating this variation, like I said, as pattern driven rather than single variable driven. So just like in doubling, two or more variables can demonstrate patterns of co-variation together. Um, like for example, they can form a cluster to index the same social factor, uh, which is something I'm really excited to be looking at um, as I continue this research. Um, or they could be used in conjunct conjunction to assert a given stance or attitude, something like that. Anything where they're really working together and they're, they're increasing the fullness of, of what they're marking and of the identities that um, they're communicating. I think that identifying this co-variation and then also respecting these ways in which the use of variance both marks um, and actively constructs social stratification is essential to arriving at more accurate and thorough descriptions of the language that we use. So this study of variation in Ende will continue to serve as a practical example of how quantitative variationist methods can be integrated into, informed by, and ultimately be supporting community emergent language documentation. Our work highlights relationships between linguistic and social factors in an understudied and theoretically marginalized contexts that's building off of and happening alongside other variationist research that's really awesome in Southern New Guinea. Um, the variation patterns not only tell us about language and society in Ende, but it also draws our attention to variation in other small multilingual communities, which have these high potentials for differences in social stratification. So I think it's vital that these languages be included um, and even further than included, um, centered in variationist analyses, not only to contrast and compare with our existing models, but just to arrive at theories of language that represent this incredible range of linguistic and social diversity beyond these traditional biases of our field. So we'd like to say thank you to the NDA language community with, um, uh, without whom this, all of this work would not have been possible. The 16 speakers who agreed to be interviewed um, and share their language for their study are all pictured here. Um, this is Paine Krupel, Donai Krupel, Sarvi Krupel, Kare Amado, Warama Krupel Suede, Kauga Dovala, Kuale Gesser, Wagiba Gesser, Tony Warama, Jerry Darda, Gloria Warama, Namaya, Namaya Karea, Wendy Frank, Winston Warama, Marian Swati Krupel, and Andrew Kauga Dovala. Um, we want to especially think, thank Warama Krupel Suede, Wagiba Gesser, and Tony. One of them, um, for their help in hosting the project, um, making all this data collection possible, and really initiating the Ende Language Committee um, uh, so many years ago. We also want to thank um, our the generous funders who funded the data collection, including the Firebird Foundation, the American Philosoph Philosophical Society, and Stanford University. We also received um, a lot of great feedback um, and helpful support from our collaborators and audiences um, from Katie Drager, Andrea Barris Croker, and Amy Schaefer at University of Hawaii Manoa, um, the audience at NWAVE 48, um, and uh, the audience when we presented this research at UH Manoa Sociolinguistics Reading Group. And then, of course, um, we want to thank the organizers of APLL 12 and the University of Oslo for hosting us. Yes, thank you so much. And thank, thank you to all of you for attending today and um, for being here virtually with us.